thank you for joining us. We're um, just in case um, we're at the if you're not at the land use section, this is the land use and mental well being section, so welcome. Um, and so, um, should we start with our social service attorneys? We'll go around and share uh, your name um, and why, so why, what brought you to the session, um, sort of like what, what about land use you're most interested in. Um, and then we'll do like an icebreaker as well to kind of get into some of the issues. Um, but before, um, just to all start off, my name is Jasmine Baines, and I'm with Prevention Institute. I'm the program coordinator in our Los Angeles office, and a lot of the work that I do revolves around healthy, ethical, active languages. And so I'm excited to have you all right here, and I'm super here with you. So to Manel. Thank you. And welcome to all of you. I'm glad we're actually in a smaller session because I'm sure you've been getting some lectured at or presented to, and um, but we can enter into a conversation, and that's important because this issue actually gets pretty deep pretty quickly because um, our communities are so fundamental to our experience and our well-being, how they're designed, how many connections we have places to be and feel safe in our communities. Um, Jasmine already mentioned I'm in our LA office. I'm Prevention Institute's Deputy Executive Director. Um, and we've been doing work around intersections between the use of built environment, a lot of policy advocacy and facilitation and collaboration around that issue. And um, I come to that interest, uh, work with a deep interest in how um, our community design shapes our health um, and well-being and have come to realize that those intersections are, are very profound. So I'm really excited for the conversation and glad for each of you to be here with us today. And so we'd just love to hear your name. And if you're from an organization and want to claim that, name that organization. And also, as Jasmine said, what you're hoping we might talk about today or what brought you to the session. Sure. So um, I'm Kelly Burnett. I'm with the Houston Parks Board. I'm the Activation and Volunteer Manager, or one of the grantees for Communities and Care Grants. So that's what brought me here today. We're really pleased to be a part of that um, community. Um, so yeah, here today with my park hat on, but also um, hoping to learn more about um, working in communities and expanding beyond parks. So obviously our collaborative works uh, in the communities on more than just getting people into parks. Thanks. My name is Rhonda Baumfield. I am a grants coordinator for New Hope Housing. I think my colleague Kayla was in this session the last time. Um, professionally interested in being here, of course, with the tie into to place-based um, intervention, programming, policy, etc. because of the affordable housing that we build and manage um, and that, that I write about. And um, I'm gathering sort of, I feel like, a better set of tools, definitions, speaking points around the things that we do, are, that we are strong in, so that I can tell the story better of what New Hope Housing is doing, but also take back where things I feel like are some missing links. And um, personally, very interested because of having grown up in Houston and being gone for a very long time in Western North Carolina and coming back and seeing what how Houston has changed in ways that it's very obvious that this area of town is is very place-based and land use active, and then others are still very much deserts, and what's going on in Houston is, is just a personal interest of mine. Thanks, Rosa. Yeah, my name is Helen Sun. I'm with Spine and the South Association. Uh, we, we are granting, we serve the Asian community. Um, yeah, um, we collaborate with churches and the Chinese language schools talking about parent training and uh, news conference training and everything. But this topic, I never think about that, so I just come here and maybe get some new knowledge or new Welcome. Hi, I'm Diana Turner. I'm with Access Health. We're in Fort Wayne County, just southwest of Houston. And I, uh, we are also one of the uh, grantees in the collaborative, uh, Community Care Collaborative. And uh, I was interested in this session because in this collaborative we've been part of, for a couple of years I've been working particularly in parks and transportation, not so much on housing yet, but I just wanted to hear Going on in that space. Awesome. We won't go to everything that's going on. Yeah. <laughs> we'll touch a few things. Um, 
things and, and also look to hear from you about what you have been doing. Um, I think Sheila started off this morning saying we're going to think together, so that's hopefully we'll set a tone for that. Um, I'm going to just rewind quickly and give you a minute to get settled in, but what we're doing is name, organization, if you're part of one, and what brought you to the session. So I'll let you get settled in and then come back to you so you don't have to put you right on the spot. Right. <laughs> you want it? Okay, go. No. Um, my name's Jordan Rito. I'm representing uh, Mental Health America, the project manager for the Women's Village Collaborative. Um, I chose this topic um, because I previously worked for Harris County Public Health, in which I worked on the Build Environment Unit, so we focused on healthy community design, so safe walks to school and um, sidewalk safety and improvements and stuff was a lot of work that we did, so I'm very familiar with that and wanted to use that and the stuff that we're doing with the Women's Village Collaborative. Welcome, that sounds great. And Jordan? Thank you. My name is Alicia Brantley, and I work with the Hair Center for Mental Health and IDD. Um, and What's your last thing stand for? I IDD. Um, what's that? Intellectual disorder. Thank you. Um, so, and I'm a family partner there, so I work hand in hand with the families, and this affects a lot of them as far as the parks, the housing, the transportation. So that alone just made me interested in the course. So I was like, okay, let me try and see what that's about. Great. So to educate the families. Thank you, Alicia. I'm Margarita Alvarez and I'm with the Hawk Foundation. We're one of the co-sponsors for this meeting and I'm here just to take time, uh, be a note taker and also record. Thank you. And I'm passing around a registration form in case someone just walked in. Thank you. Sir. Okay. <clears throat> My name is Andre Outley, and I'm the executive director and co-founder of Blue Process Pride, Rites of Passage. And we're a boys uh, mentoring organization. We mentor um, urban uh, males, uh, primarily uh, middle school and high school. And uh, I chose this topic because um, doing the work that we do, um, I see a lot of the challenges that are the, 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 the young men and the families that we serve as it relates to transportation, as it relates to um, fair and equitable housing, um, safe places to play. So um, I just kind of wanted to uh, see what this discussion is about and how it can help us to bring back the lives that we enjoy. Awesome. At the end of the last session, we also talked about building more leadership in this area, and I feel like an uh, organization working on rights of passage and young men's issues could be so powerful in naming and claiming what our neighborhoods should look like. So I'm really glad that you're here. So thank you. And we're doing name, organization, and what brought you to this session. Welcome. Hi, my name is Angelica Edwards. Uh, Social work at Sasha Shoe Pediatrics Clinic. I'm on the art side. Um, what was this session was um, just finding resources to help the families that I work with. So I um, was mentioning, hopefully, for some of the folks in here can share some resources with you. My only um, real tie to Houston, I'm from, as I mentioned, from LA. My sister-in-law lived in Sugar Land, and so recent, till recently, she's now in McKinney. So we've come and spent many holidays here and have some some sense of the lay of the land um, and, and what it was like for her to raise my nephew in the community. And um, he was a in the car to everything baby. She had to drive him to everything, and that really shapes, and it, I understand that it's changed since even since she's left um, from my conversation in the last um, in the last session. Um, but one of the things we want to do now is just for a minute or two get you all talking to each other to just go a little deeper on the issues that you touched on or what brought you here, but also um, to share a little bit about your own personal stories um, in, in neighborhood and community. So we put three questions up on the board, and if you could just turn to the person closest to you to talk about together, introduce yourself a little bit more, um, and share whether or not you live or work in a neighborhood 
where you're close to a safe place to play, um, a park and open space, or you can talk about the children or the families that you work with. Um, whether or not you live or work in a community where there's a high concentration of alcohol, um, liquor stores, marijuana dispensaries, or, or polluting land uses. Um, and whether or not, and you might not know this, it's okay um, if you don't, but your grandparents would have been prevented from living in that community because of their race, ethnicity, or religion. And so this is just an opportunity for us to think about how our own lives have been shaped by and shaped the land use and built environment work. So we'll give you just a couple minutes for that and then come back um, into a conversation. Yeah, so just overhearing the conversations, you know, I think there are the folks brought up a lot of different issues and I really want to dig in more to the times have changed piece of it um, as we talk about land use and the built environment. So maybe we can get into that, but I wasn't listening as closely to your group. Is there anything that came up that you were talking that you want to just put into the middle of the conversation? We were, um, well, at least my story. I, I grew up in the suburbs uh, here, and you, know, you have the master plan communities where you do have access to parks and the subdivision. Um, that kind of eliminates the concentration of alcohol and things like that. Mm -hmm. But my grandparents, um, when they were coming up, would not have been allowed in, in that area. And there used to be signage to, to say that you need to stay out. Very explicit signage. Um, so yes, times have changed in that way. That now that area is very diverse. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anything else? Similarly, I was in the suburbs I grew up in, um, a Leaf, and um, it was where two working parents went to send their kids to school in a non-HISD, sort of a very planned, quote-unquote, protected scenario, racially diverse, but economically very homogenous. And then, um, obviously, that's changed drastically, and um, we always felt safe going off for hours and hours and hours on end on bike and by foot until you know we had to come home. And then you know, today, just watching that and going back every once in a while, um, I just it's so amazing how it has changed. And what has changed? Oh, just the the access to um, safe spaces. You know, the access to uh, so any. And this is from what I understand from people who live there currently or who have lived there current, you know, recently. And then just, you know, coming and going in the area. New Hope Housing, we're getting ready to put a housing development uh, community close to that area. So we're having a lot of dialogue about what's available. And there's just not safe space for kids to grow up um, safely. I heard you saying the same thing on Ray about your own kids. Yes. What makes a safe, what as a parent, what makes you feel like a safe base is safe for your kids? What are the signs that you know this is safe or feel safe in your gut that you can What are safe spaces? It's a little heavy, you know, like drugs, uh -huh. um, traffic, you know, that's number one. Um, like where I grew up, we had a lot of um, um, drug dealing. Mm -hmm. And Rachel mentioned so prostitution. Yeah. And like and for me, like with my kids, um, I have a 16 year old son and a seven year old daughter. Um, when I see debris, like I see trash everywhere, I automatically like, okay, no. But it's 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 yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. As soon as I see that, I'm like, okay, this is a this is a different type of area. Somebody around, you know, even like kind of on topic but off topic. Uh, my grandmother lives in the southeast area, which is considered the you know projects. Um, I was outside one day and I saw a guy who was dump it chocolate, like, what do you do? Like I ran down the street, like what do people live here? You know, so that type of thing, you know, I look at it like, well, do they care about the neighborhood? Is this it's not normal, you know? And because I'm not accustomed to seeing it, well, I wasn't raised around it. So for me, it's, it automatically stands out when I go into the area of windmill. Yeah. So for me and my kids, if they can't walk down a sidewalk because tires and mattresses and, you know, whatever else, pain and whatever they're dropping off for there, that's it's a red flag for me. Thank you. It was such important science. Please I introduce yourself. So we did an introduce yourself and if you don't mind before you oh. say your response. So my name is Donna Travis and I'm uh, with the Woods of Village Community Resilience Project. Well, one of the things that um, that I think that's different now as compared to um, years back is that we knew the people that 
that lived in the community around us. They knew us, you knew, you knew them, they knew you, you had common values so that, say for instance, your child was out, even if you weren't there, you knew that somebody with similar values of yours would be kind of watching them also. And that's not the way we live now. Half the time, you know, we don't even know our neighbors. So that's, that's, that's one of the things when I think of safety that we don't have now that we used to have. You said Diana? Donna, sorry. In our last session, one of the women was saying, I know my neighbor's dog name, but I don't even know the neighbor's name. It was like a very pointed thing. She's like, and I only know their name because they're always screaming at their dog, Lewis, Lewis. <laughs> Knowing your neighbors is so important. It is so basic. Like this, like this idea of it takes a village all comes from, from that. Um, and knowing that someone will tell you and call, be able to call you up and be like, I saw your kid doing this, that, or the other, and you know, help out a little bit. So thank you for raising that. And I think our my position has been that the way that we design our communities, that we maintain our communities, and I'm talking when I talk about we, I mean we, and also government, local government, public works, you know, sanitation, maintain it communicates a lot about that. It creates opportunities for social interaction or for the breakdown of them. And so I think this connection in terms of our communities and mental well-being is, is just so important. I started off in the built environment work. Um, I think more thinking about it in terms of walking and physical activity. And as I've gotten into it more, it's becoming so much clearer to me that these social connections are really, really at the sort of core of, of it. So I really appreciate that. Sir, tell us your name and what brought you to the session, and if you want to mention anything that's coming up just as you've heard the tail end of our conversation. Sure. So, uh, hi everyone, my name is Corey, I work for the Center of West Hill. Uh, we're in the QHC, the nonprofit healthcare agency in the east side of Houston. And um, I think the third part was what brought me here. The uh, reason I came here is because in our community specifically, uh, we're doing a lot of new gentrification. Uh, not just in terms of gentrification, but in terms of displacement, uh, which is often uh, unaccounted for and people are not, there, there's no data behind displacement, right? Uh, we know who's coming into the neighborhood, we don't know who's going out or where they're going. Um, and so that's, that's what brought me in here. Uh, we, as a healthcare agency, are supportive of the Houston Community Land Trust model, uh, which is a housing uh, option uh, in the city of Houston. This is kind of being developed. Uh, we've been uh, uh, advocating for it to come into our neighborhood in order to uh, create spaces where people can remain uh, in perpetuity. Uh, and so that's, that's what I was interested in. Um, outside of that, our, our community is, is uh, can be ravaged by stray dogs and other issues of, of uh, uh, the environment, sidewalks, uh, alcohol use, and other things that are strong on the street. And so just looking at ways of, of uh, we're trying to learn of, of ways that we can, uh, as a healthcare agency, advocate for these uh, things to be Pay attention to by the most of power um, and to by our community. Thank you, Jorge. Very much. And I think all of you collectively touched on some issues. I want to quickly run through some, some slides, Jasmine, if you don't mind. Um, kind of running through what we want to just really emphasize and what you've already spoken to is not all neighborhoods are created equally, but importantly, I think in your conversation, that neighborhoods change over time, so so they're not static either. Um, and that becomes an important um, part of our conversation as we're trying to think about what kind of neighborhoods create opportunities and provide resources for people to be thriving and healthy. Um, Dr. Martinez mentioned earlier in his opening that zip code is a very powerful predictor, much more powerful than our genetic code of our health outcomes. And I think that's really important because one of the things that we don't often say is that the differences between zip code don't just happen by accident. There are a series of structural policy decisions, and often those are racist policy decisions. Um, even if people aren't being evil racists, the policies are producing racist outcomes, and we need to recognize that we have persistent, ongoing, and sometimes widening gaps in terms of outcomes at the neighborhood level. Um, if we look at Harris County, we can see that those place-based and zip code-related outcomes are costing people years of life. 
And I know that there's been a lot of thought that maybe if we could just give everybody health care, that would solve it. But we now know that our health outcomes are determined by much more than our access to health care and even social services. It has a huge amount to do with the places that we live, work, and play. And we say that so often, but I think, again, this idea that we need to work at the policy and systems level to recreate the places that we live, work, and play so that they produce health and well-being and create opportunities, for example, for social connections, which we know are very healing and nurturing, even in the absence of all the most beautiful things in the built environment. Uh, but this is critical. We can save lives and we can increase the quality of people's lives from childhood to adulthood by looking, for example, at the physical environment. Um, if we look at this issue, we have someone from the park, two people from the park who are here, or what? Just you? Um, and someone else working on parks. Um, and, you know, there are significant you know, differences with the red areas showing very high park need. And without knowing Houston very well, I would venture to say that those areas with very high park need are also most heavily concentrated African American and Latino, and also the most uh, least well off in terms of income and socioeconomic status, because that pattern is happening in almost every context. The one thing that we might say here with the subdivision issue is that there are private parks that provide green space for people. And, and also, I look down from the plane and see people with huge backyards. But I think what becomes important about that is that parks, public parks, provide a different function than your private backyard or than the community housing <coughs> development space. And so we need to think about that. But also, if parks departments are thinking about what does a 21st century park look like and do, it's so much more than what we thought of when we thought of going to the parks when we were a kid. It needs to be a place that captures and reuses water. It might provide a safe space in, the, in an era of, in, when a disaster hits. It might provide a place for people to come and protest when there's been something wrong that's happened in the community. So parks are really these very important social hubs. Um, and these differences, I think we've all said and know, um, are creating, uh, are unfair and unjust, and they impact our every aspect of our health, physical, mental, spiritual, um, and so on. One of our mentors, and me and Jasmine, um, who formerly worked at UCLA um, School of Public Health, um, said the built environment is social policy and concrete. And I really appreciate that sentiment, because so often when I've gone from community to community, we have this idea that somebody is, else is making the community and creating it. And often, the changes in community happen over such a slow pace that we don't think of ourselves as being able to be agents of change of the community. <clears throat> but yet, we are. And so we need to engage with this social policy and feel like it's something that can change. And not just, I'm just going to move somewhere else, um, because that's a challenge. And, and I say that recognizing that sometimes being forced to move happens because of a disaster like Katrina, or sometimes it happens because people are getting priced out of their community. And so how do we look at those global phenomena that are going to impact us all with increasing climate change, forced, in, in forced migration, and then displacement um, in the context of, yes, we may live in a low income community, but yes, we would also like a place to eat healthy, and yes, we would also like a nice, safe park to play, and don't feel like we should have to be gentrified out of our community to have that. And so these are very complex issues with very few easy solutions. Have you found an easy solution? <laughs> but we do need to have the conversation. Um, but if we look back and why I feel so comfortable and uncomfortable at the same time talking about racist policy is that segregation is really at the heart of our urban policy. Um, and gentrification is also a, a displacement and erasure and ignoring cultures and people in place is the founding doctrine of America. Okay, we all didn't learn nearly enough in school about the millions of indigenous people that lived here in thriving societies before Europeans got here, um, and Africans that came before Columbus. And so we, in not having those conversations, we erase a whole deeper understanding of why we have um, separate but not equal, and that has informed all kinds of land use decisions that play out today. Um, we also know that redlining policy of the United States and practice of you know major banking, that federal banking decision, 
was codified segregation. And a lot of times we limit that thinking to just being about housing. But what do we know about segregation and redlining? Well, I mean, obviously it's going to um, affect representation on a political level, so even just community organizing at the most basic level. And we'll, yes, thank you. And also, we know that all kinds of services follow housing and people's subjective decisions about who can pay for what services and what a community deserves. And so it wasn't just like, oh, only African American people can live there because we won't give them loans. But it was also true for small business owners and perhaps uh, true for the quality of schools that fall out there, the kinds of other services. So this is such a <laughs> fundamental kind of element of the fabric. Any other comments here? Because this is deep stuff. So at New Hope Housing, we have that map blown up. And what's shocking is to me the legend, which you can't read. Yeah. But it's like desirable, less desirable, undesirable, don't even go there. Like, don't even spend money there. And or I don't know what it says verbatim, but that's, that's the that's, gist that's, of it. That's the message. <laughs> and um, and you know when I look at like now I'm talking about the record of my job because we cannot advocate uh, public policy, but as an individual and in my personal interest is in seeing how how could that be how could that be economically um, accounted for? And like I don't even know reparations. Yeah, but um, so, anyway. um, but I think the other piece is that um, this idea of who looks and gets to say what's desirable about a community still impacts our field today. So I always have considered myself a real, you know, champion for healthy communities. And as we've started to define healthy communities, we have these sets of scorecards or report cards. Everywhere I've lived for the last, I don't know how many years, it would be a D or a C. It's an unhealthy community according to someone else. But we know that beautiful things happen in our so-called unhealthy community. And culture is there, and assets are there, there, and knowing your neighbors is there. And so how do we hold that at the same time? That there are things we want to preserve that make our communities affordable, that show our arts and culture, that test to our narrative as a, as a community, and not just have a presume that we want a Starbucks, that means we've arrived, or we want to, you know, whatever, and that makes us a community that's somehow desirable and all of a sudden visible to people. I feel for me, that's one of the most painful things about gentrification. It's not just that people with a little more income are moving in, but it's like they come in and they're like, ta-da, we found your community, and, <laughs> and, and we didn't know y'all were here, like, and, and why haven't you been advocating for anything that civilized would want like a you know and it's deep so it's very deep and it's an experience then and a loss a feeling of loss and, and grief that I feel associated with it even though I would like some of the investments to come in so that's really complicated stuff what uh, it's very complicated uh, I heard someone else call it the uh, Columbus Conference uh, yeah. where you would discover something that was right there uh, yeah uh, Eureka yeah uh, and, uh, my, my comment was is that sometimes even Today, in terms of redlining, uh, we still are perpetrating some of these things. The other day on television, um, a channel, local channel, um, highlights neighborhoods from around the city. But they highlight those desirable neighborhoods, right? So they don't highlight some of those undesirable neighborhoods. Uh, there's, there's a magazine in Houston that highlights having the hottest neighborhoods that, that, that caters to all those uh, uh, young professionals and men who are moving to the city that are coming. Uh, potentially gentrifiers, right? Uh, but it caters to them and says, these are the hardest neighborhoods you want to be in. This is where you, you should invest your money into. And those places are not entirely always uh, uh, the, 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 the places where you can say, come in and also be respectful and quote through the rate it sits. You know, it says, come in and we have hot bars. There's, you know, it's where all the pretty people hang out. You know, and it doesn't say there are people there that, that live there for most so I think we still, uh, in, in, in our culture, in, in, in our media, and in, in everything that we do, we still are perpetrating some of these things. Absolutely. And anybody want to respond or react or add on to that? It's so right on. I to me, it is anyway. Very much so. Um, it, um, unfortunately, it, it's only after the, the gentrification is underway that 
now there's suddenly there's funding, and you know there's 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 monies that, that banks are offering to build up a community that was already there, but needed some buy-in, and so I know my like I said I grew up in Third Ward, and that was a time when like, I think we moved when in 1978, and uh, my parents were like. You know, okay, 288's coming. 288 wasn't there. You know, so so Highway 288's coming. Um, the family started to move out, and um, investors who didn't live there were buying up homes and breaking them into you know four places. Mm-hmm. You know, and so the monies weren't there. They they they, they weren't sowing any new monies into that community to continue to have it exist. So then we we moved to, like at the time, it was considered a middle class, another middle class area, the higher Park area. And so we moved to that side of town, supposedly we've got schools, you know, what have you. So it's like the red lining is alive and well today, and it is, it's 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 like license segregation because if you can't if you can't you know fund you know if businesses can't thrive in a community it's gonna die it's gonna die and third war used to be a hub I mean it's coming back to be a hub now because you got these multi million dollar houses that are being <laughs> that are being built on the bayou you know which. You know, increasing property tax for big moms. Thank you, and they can't, they can't afford it. They can't afford it. So we, you got the investors coming in and say, oh, we'll give you $100,000, and, and you can go and go to the retirement home, and they'll come down and, and, and bulldoze the house. And then now it's, it's $4 million. You're right outside of downtown Houston. So it's like legalized segregation for real. It would be great if, if I mean, Individuals who lived, he brought up Third Ward, who grew up in Third Ward, you know, went off to school to get a better education, got a, a great career. What they're doing is they're moving to the suburbs. You know, they're going to get more land and start their families instead of coming back to their roots yeah. and building there. And really, that'll be some change if everybody just had the same idea. We're going back to our roots. We're going back to take take back our community. Um, and then, you know, all the other things will, will take place because, I mean, people that, like, people have money, <laughs> but they're not wanting to move back into the neighbors. However, they do go back to get their hair done. They go back to get their hair cut. They go back to go to church, whatever, but they just don't want to live there. So. But, you know, their grandmother and things like that are, are there, and the homes are paid for, but property taxes are too much, and then, you know, then you have their, their um, children who try to take care of it, but can't make they not knowledgeable about how to pay or whatever. Yeah, so you have all those different risk yeah. factors and stuff, and then it's a cycle. Yes. It's a cycle, yes. it's a cycle and it's happening in so many places. I mean, every, this is happening globally, and it's happening in virtually every every city. We hear this, this um, cycle, and, um, and I really, really appreciated the comment about the license segregation because these are choices. All of a sudden money disappeared that wasn't yes. there. And and so people everywhere are like, are they doing this for us or are they doing this for the people who are gonna come here? And in the last session we talked about how many of us had lived in neighborhoods whose names changed and how your name changed was a sign of it typifying <laughs> the and renaming neighborhoods and that sort of like the developers and the um, our branding communities like it's a commodity and not respecting all the sweat equity that communities have put into making it so that it is a place. And and the backstory for this though is that somehow we don't believe that everybody deserves a community that's thriving and complete. That there only can be some communities and somehow that's a deep part of this under underlying story that we need to have uh, inequity in order to somehow we need to leave some areas in neglect. And so that's another piece of this that we need to crack open, I think. Let's keep going.
building. We've talked already, Andre already talked about highways coming to yes. communities. Um, and this really reinforces what Don talked about. Talk about the best way to not know your neighbor. Be in the freeway uh, in a car for two hours on your commute and leave before dark and don't get home till after dark. And the, so the highway becomes a real metaphor for breaking up community in multiple ways. Um, and that this scenario is partly the result of that. But this was another place around choices of investment, because all of a sudden, when we decided as a, as a trend in a society that the money didn't belong in cities, a lot of money and incentives went out to promoting developers, yes. going, building out far where the freeways took them quickly and building these new communities, rather That's than investing right. in our public system that were at the core of communities. And now we have the repatriation and repopulation of cities happening all over, but we're creating those cities in a way that cares about millennials more than the people that have been there. So I was down um, in San Antonio last year and met with the San Antonio River Authority, and we were talking about the redevelopment along the river, and they were just, we were asked, I was asking about equity and racial equity, and they were basically like, Developers want to know what millennials want. They want to. They want. They're building sustainable communities because that's what millennials want. And it's sort of like who is the desired citizen of our new city? Um, and so that is, you know, goes back to the kind of issue about looking at the community and who's the deserving resident of what we're building and who we're building for. Um, another policy and practice that has led to the conditions we see today that um, have disrupted intergenerational wealth building once again was our major foreclosure crisis. Jasmine and I were looking at the talking point and it said this foreclosure crisis of 2008 was the one we yeah. had, when the bubble burst, this was the largest loss of wealth of people of color in American history. And homeownership is, is a key way that our families have accumulated wealth to pass on to generations, hopefully. Um, but that fell out of reach for a lot of people. Um, and what I think is important is what you already said, Andre. This is not just some stuff that we can look about at history and what is happening today. And we need to be smart about what we're seeing um, when, and it is impacting our health outcomes. Um, so we, um, we have identified a set of norms in our current land use system. And norms are tricky because they're like invisible aspects of our culture, and we need new norms to guide our land use decisions. Um, we are, um, go ahead, Jasmine, you want to go through these? Sure. Okay. Um, so one of the challenges is that inequitable planning and development contribute to the health inequities we see in our communities. And so, you know, thinking about, so what, what does that look, what would that look like to change that? So policies, practices, investments should be designed and implemented to support mental health and, and safety and well-being, especially for uh, those you know, uh, marginalized uh, mothers and children and sort of excluded groups. Another challenge we see is that land is valued for profit, you know, over public good. And so that explains a lot of times what we're seeing. And so what will the new norm be to actually center and focus on on equity, focus on mental health, and community well-being over um, the value of the land. And I think Jorge talked about this when talking about a land trust, that concept of pulling land off of the speculative market and having it owned by people in perpetuity for residents or whatever. We, I sat on the board of a park land trust, same thing. Pulling land off and owning it for 100 years or more in a way that it can't just be got, wow. given to the highest bidder. And it was kind of like the woman in the main session, um, Dr. Ford, when she was saying we have other assets in our community yes. that might not be monetary. This new norm would really recognize that, that we're not just about the best, the most expensive condo for the highest bidder, but we really believe there's an intrinsic value in creating land use and building houses and parks in a way that supports well-being and longevity and nurtures community life with a living creature. That. Please. So one of the things that uh, we're working with now is, so the Park Dedication Fund is one of the ways that the city will um, fund and try to combat the 10-minute walk park gap that, um, you know, we saw that map earlier. Um, but unfortunately, the way it was set up, and I'm sure, like you said, it wasn't an evil racist who set it up. It's definitely not like a 
it's not. Um, <laughs> but it ends up in a way that the investments, where the investments are going in the new developments in Houston, that's the district that that money has to be spent in buying new parks or improving new parks. Um, so by nature of what gets gentrified gets new parks, essentially the way it's set up now. And so it's sort of a, okay, we have to work on that on a policy um, standpoint and figuring that out. Um, and then in the meantime, you've got to figure out how to fundraise and help the parks that haven't had the money or the neighborhoods that haven't had the parks. So LA Cap City did a revision of its what we call our company yeah. policy. So if you want to see the policy, we're saying we worked on that. Now she's our resilience. Oh, officer. great. Well, then you don't need any information. <laughs> <laughs> like basically, right? But basically, this cycle that happens where develop, money follows more development, follows more development, and then this idea that they could, it's either, for us, it was either a developer could build a park in their development to basically um, place open space that they were taking up by creating a development, or they could put it in a dedication fund, which is very common in development, right? They can do any kind of dedication to some other social good. But for us, it was the same thing. It had to be like within a certain mile radius. And so that was ending up actually creating a vicious cycle of like Santa Monica's because getting all the development and all the park, you know, money and the development. So we had to basically create new definitions and new distance radiuses because in LA you could go 10 miles and all of a sudden you're in a lower income community. And so being able to create a, a mechanism where the decision makers, the local government park developers could put those resources in a low income community that is actually already been defined as high park need. And um, now we need people to wash out that policy. So that's been a challenge. It's, it wasn't enough to change the policy, but getting people to actually move that money is another part of the story. So can you please? Um, so another challenge we see is to do with outreach. And so residents are oftentimes engaged haphazardly, and oftentimes after decisions have been made. And another challenge is, you know, there's defining what authentic community engagement looks like. What if, and, and having, you know, agencies, particularly government staff, knowing like how to properly engage, who to partner with to do engagement um, before policy decisions are made. And so, in a better um, system, we would have broad based inclusive community engagement that guides all land use decisions. And that one, I want to say, is so mushy but it's so important and we really <laughs> need to wrap our brains around how do we create mechanisms that really flip almost everything we do related to land use and Buckfield's environment on its head. Communities know what they need and they need to be involved from the very beginning and then what they say <coughs> needs to be stewarded by decision makers and right now we have it so backwards that we feel like those decisions are so complicated that engineers and technical people make the decisions and then they use the community to consult or affirm once things are already decided. And it doesn't have to be that way. This is so small. Um, I, uh, the, the church I attend is uh, the Fountain Park, and it, it's not in the area that I that I live. And um, but I, that was I didn't know what um, I, I, I'm known about what HEB is, but I didn't know what Joe V was. H-E-B is the grocery H-E-B store? is like a major chain yeah. here, in, here in Texas. Okay. But I didn't know what Joe V was. And so I saw a thing that said, you know, Joe V is coming. He's going to be building at this. They had the spot already designated or what have you. And then uh, I was at a, a attended a, a, like a panel discussion at my church. And they were like, you know, we're protesting this, this Joe V coming into the neighborhood. And I was like, what I had this growth has changed. And, but what what we learned after this, like you said, after the decisions has already been made, Joe V is a more scaled down base version of H E B. So the premium meets no, that doesn't go to, to Joe V. Joe V you sack your own groceries. Yeah. H E B is a premium and it was like, what? This is just a few years ago. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, oh my God. And when you, if you go into a Jovi and you go into an HEV, it's nowhere they could be owned by the same company. And they're owned by the same company. So, yeah, this issue, this has happened, has happened in so many places. It's a food, dis food discrimination. Oh. And, um, and, um, 
this is why I feel that communities so often feel that planning is done to them. And we, I think, really need to get to a new place with that and have a new vision for that. Because if we are going to continue to make people feel excluded and isolated when we, and it happens on small and large, right? Small and large scales. Go ahead, I'm just going to make a comment about what the German said it. I think that's very important to mention because oftentimes in the geographic spaces that we're in, of course, we have food insecurity. We want a grocery store to come in. Yes. Then they offer us the lower quality. Yes. And, and, so yes. it's, and, and that's exactly what it is. It's, it's having the power to advocate uh, and, and say, we have an issue with food insecurity. Yes, we want a grocery store. But don't just give us any grocery store, right? Don't just give us hand it down and give, give us the healthy produce, give us the good produce. Well, they're getting up, you know, the asparagus too. We're getting up. We want to be a part of that. So it's very important. To and when you dialogue with the leadership, <laughs> when you dialogue with the leadership, there is, there is no explanation for why we can't build an ATV here. You're going to need the same space. There's no explanation for it. I do even have the issue with, and I've been doing it most of my life. Um, you have the issue of, okay, you have Walmart in the hood, and you have Walmart in the more middle class or high class area, but the produce is totally different. So, I mean, I can't buy my produce in the hood. I have to go, you know, um, about 30 miles, not 30 miles, 30 minutes or 45 minutes away from where I live just to get fresh produce. That's true. Not to be judging, but Walmart's just bad for all land use planning. <laughs> 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 But it's true. Like I went to a, I went, I went to a Walmart <laughs> in uh, Sugarland on a different level. But yeah. I went to a Walmart in Sugarland. Perfect, good experience. I went to the one right here off the Beltway. In the middle of the night, I wanted to buy a television. The electronics <laughs> department was closed. It like had a gate with an alarm, and I was just like, "What?" <laughs> like I called court. I just couldn't understand. I was yeah. like, where, you, you know. We could do a whole session on Walmart, by the way. <laughs> my, my, family loved, my family loved to go from San Antonio to Seguin to get some Seguin sausages. And so we'd go, and Seguin had this really cute Main Street, right? It had the sausage place, a little hardware store. Boy, Walmart came in two years later. Nobody was, no, every business had gone out of business. And then Walmart left. And so Walmart is a really big problem for us in terms of land use, development, local and ownership, and all that. And then their practices, and, you know, there are many it's practices, our areas. subjective practices. And the worst part is, then they make you feel like you're crazy for even mentioning it. I mean, they say, no, it's exactly the same. It's Walmart is Walmart. So that we really can't have good conversation about what is the quality that we deserve without coming up against what I think is a very biased narrative, which is just like, you should be happy. You should just be happy. You're getting whatever, you know? And that is, um, that is really a problem in communities that are used to living in resistance and struggle and really advocating for what for what they want. And then you want to turn around and sell me asparagus juice, which, you know, my, my grandmother probably made as like a healing medicinal <laughs> Go ahead, Jeffy. Yeah, just to reinforce that, you know, oftentimes kids are having to be reactive, right? And so a lot of the energy that they, that goes into is just development projects and finding project by project. So why not, you know, why is it that their wisdom, their needs being addressed from the very beginning when these decisions, decisions are being sort of planned? And so that is what the new norm should be. Um, Another challenge that we're seeing is that issues are approached and funded in silos. So oftentimes that causes competition or resources, you know, um, folks want a part, but folks also want, you know, transportation. So why can't we have both? Why can't we sort of partner up and the new norm have more comprehensive, collaborative, multi-sector, multi-benefit projects um, to, to achieve those, all, everything that we need want? One of my friends was, uh, I had interviewed her for it, she was saying, we need our local governments to act more like a single mom on a budget to meet everybody's needs, <laughs> instead of acting like they all <laughs> Yeah, it was really like a great analogy, and she's like, 
like, you know, because they all act like they don't have enough money to do what's needed for the people, but they are all working, like, one issue at a time. And of course, we know a mom on a budget is getting as many kids' needs, as many shoes on feet as she can, all of that. And so that was a really good way of thinking about how we need to jolt our local, you know, collaborators into a different way of working. And then again, just that, you know, best interest benefit from not from the status quo and therefore you know, make reform challenging and again just saying that advocates and studios spend a lot of time and energy, you know, fighting projects, um, uh, and or fighting to all the project process. And so then why can't lessons learn from group projects and land use innovation be scaled up and actually systemize it in our policies and um, practices that we see. Is that one resonating with folks? Or is it not making sense? That last one. Did you understand where we're coming with that one? This is a new norm. I mean, this is exactly like what Andre's saying. His whole church and community had to work on fighting the bad J Julie B or whatever it was. Julie, yeah. and as opposed to being able to say from the beginning, what is the food resource environment that this community wants? It might have been not only the HEB, but a farmer's market and a this, and how come we don't have a 10-year plan that we're working towards that thing instead of making you at the last minute waste your energy fake fighting Joey V or whatever? So I don't know that we need to talk about this. But I feel like this group is strong in this, but oh, maybe go on the last one. I think, no, go to the other one. One of the things that we're finding in our work is it's really helpful to think about equity in some different dimensions and break it down. And this has become helpful because what we find is, is have found when we get into conversations about public infrastructure and what, what healthy communities are, um, sometimes the conversation breaks down because people believe in equity as a value, but when you start talking about moving resources in different ways, the conversation falls apart because they actually like the idea of fairness, but don't like the idea of money maybe going to the third ward instead of some other place. And so we talk about equity in terms of procedural equity. So that means the processes we engage in are equitable and that people are there having not only a seat at the table, but some leadership distributional equity, meaning we're really re-examining how we're spending resources. Um, like, for example, Ray, Ray Leisha was talking about the community not having the, the uh, trash picked up or the thing. That's not just like, oh, those people are messier than other people. I mean, yes, of course, they're littering, but everyone litters, unfortunately. And what we have probably have less is much less frequent visits by the Bureau of Sanitation and much less frequent visits by public works. And that's the kind of thing when we think about distribution of resources. And then structural equity is the other dimension that we really mentioned, and that one's a little bit more invisible, but has to do with the uh, policies and procedures that happen inside of institutions, and why we get the situation that Rhonda talked about, where someone's looking at the community and saying, well, that's not really a community that's still deserving of investing in. That has to do with structural biases that have long roots, as we just discovered. And then we also talk now more and more in terms of these dimensions as well, looking at historic disadvantage, present day disadvantage, and current current practices, but also saying we need to not just look at, Dr. Ed in the last session said, not just look at intentions, but also look at impacts and outcomes. And when we look at outcomes and impacts, then that gives us an opportunity to decide if we need to course correct, um, because even well-meaning um, projects, thank you so much, Mark, we have 15 more minutes, um, meaning efforts to whatever, fund parks and open space, may not produce equitable impacts, and we need to be ready to examine that in real time and engage the people in that conversation about why, what's happening and why that's happening. And too often, in LA, for example, we have a lot of these voter-approved bond measures that have just passed since 2016. And once they get passed, everyone cries victory, and then you never hear about where the money went. 30 years later, you might get an engineer's report that writes like, oh, we spent 50,000 here and 60, but nothing in an aggregated way that would help the community and public you know, nonprofits say, hey, that was wrong, or we need a new spending pattern. So that helps break this down. Go ahead, Jesse. And 
So a lot of the work that we do in LA um, for our healthy echo land use um, we fall under what we would say, what we call are the four strategic pillars. Um, and so these are basically strategies that we think um, used to embed equity in land use systems. And I'll just interject, so we, about five years ago, formed a healthy, equitable land use network. And because of that issue, Jen, we was saying was that organizations working on different issues were sort of working in silos. So there were people, the bike advocates working on the bike issues, the walk advocates working on the walk issues, the not, uh, environmental issues, the groups working on their issues and housing. And when we got together, we realized that they, we were all kind of fighting the same system or struggling with the same system, which we just kind of described to you. And so we developed this platform, the four pillars, which has worked around this four pillars that Jasmine is about to share. But the idea for us was to get from being reactive to proactively describing what is the land use system that we need in order to create the outcomes in the built environment that we're trying to aim for in terms of how we will and the first one being to increase the percentage of public funds invested in ongoing infrastructure, especially in low income communities of color. So in Los Angeles, um, just like I mentioned, we passed a lot of public infrastructure measures. In particular, um, measure A is a hard stepping measure. And um, because of all the people measure A and the other measures, this is an opportunity to really embed equity into, these, uh, into the implementation. So one of the things that for this particular measure is sets aside 13% of the funding for high need and and very high need park areas in Los Angeles, Los Angeles County. So LA County did a park needs assessment and was able to sort of identify where the where is park needs the highest. And um, so this um, this was known after a lot of organizations advocated for for this set aside. And in addition to that, also asked for technical assistance um, or to go out for low income jurisdictions to actually go after the grant money. In addition to set, um, and outreach standards, um, were also baked within this measure. And so it's starting to be implemented. So now. let me just add, like, getting that 13% was such a huge fight. It started off that the expenditure plan, draft expenditure plan said 18%. So the parcel tax was gonna raise about $94 million a year. And we said, you know, because of these high need areas, we need to make sure there's a pot that definitely goes to high need communities. And all these wealthier homeowner groups showed up at the Board of Supervisors and were like, they don't need parts. They have other issues they're dealing with. So this is where you have basically racist and biased rhetoric playing out in very subtle ways. So we had to fight hard to preserve that 13%. So even though it's a victory, it's a painful, it's a painful victory. And then later on in the implementation process, we really had to fight hard to insist that the agency that was administering the funds would um, prioritize proposals coming from high need communities. And you know, this is a really challenging issue because there aren't always organizations ready to build parts in high need areas for different reasons. And so this is something that's needed and we need much more of it, but it is hard, hard, back-breaking, uh, tear-inducing work. So would you see a difference, a large difference specifically in the difference up between neighborhoods where there's high ownership versus neighborhoods where it was more renter, renters and the voice that they might have because of that? And if so, um, I guess the next bigger question is how to um, make up for that difference. Um, so that question itself is super, speaks to a very deep understanding of, I think, the, the, the challenge and opportunity. So what we found is that by engaging organizing groups, we could overcome the challenge of greater or lesser engagement in certain communities. But what was needed was elevating parks as a front burner issue and parks as a health issue. And, and so we were able to win really through people power. But inherently, sort of at the status quo, whiter, wealthier communities had much more organized access to the decision makers. And so they had an immediate ear to their boards of supervisors, who in this case were the decision makers. So deep leadership development toward organizing and what's and the 
resourcing the organizations that helped to do that was incredibly important for getting to, to that victory. Um, so I don't know if that is yeah, the question. It also kind of makes me think that the parks issue being a tool to then gather and educate and train and empower people to then take on even greater different issues, other yeah. needs. And it was pretty powerful because a lot of times people think, well, parks are like back burger issues. Like we have school, we have food, we have all these issues that are, are understandably. But at the last hearing on the implementation guidelines, how many people generally were there? Hundreds yeah. testifying. And it was like moms, like I just want, like in tears. And young people, and just like in tears about how profound, like this, just like I just want a safe place to send my kids to walk, or my kids have asthma, or I have a special needs kid, and I have to put my child in a car and go an hour before I can get to a park. Like that's, you know, so it was actually a very moving example of how when you actually talk to people in terms that resonate with them, they have their own experiences and stories that move the issue much more than a technical. But, you know, conversation about like a plot of grass and a play structure you know, it's very deep for people. And it gets to people's connection to land in a very deep way. Our second strategy is to build capacity in government and private sector and communities organizations to do inclusive engagement and um, in land use play. So, um, this, and so one example that we've seen um, that folks in the Pacific Northwest have really started thinking about what is it meant to like specifically Seattle um, back in 2008 the mayor uh, passed uh, an executive order that basically said we need to create our framework around community engagement and they developed a inclusive uh, outreach and community engagement guide that guides all the engagement that the city takes on all departments. And um, one of the sort of disruptive things in, uh, was they dismantled their city's neighborhood council system because it was not representative of the cultural and racial diversity of the city and instead replaced it with the Community Involvement Commission, which CERC, which is a board of about seven folks from each of the seven areas in Seattle that actually vote in and have power, voting power to, about uh, which projects get funded in the neighborhood. Any sort of reaction to your questions about that? Um, so our strategy, uh, another strategy is to accelerate land use innovations and demonstration projects and policies in, in low income communities of color and to scale up those pilot kind of projects. So I'll let Manel talk about her decision to I mean, you can just skip this, Jasmine, but I think it's the idea that we have good things happening in a lot of communities, but oftentimes it's like one cool project, and we're not having that change the systemic way that we do things. So like with Project New Hope, build an affordable housing, I can, I'll guess without knowing anything about your context. It's like you do one amazing one, and then you have to start over a whole new relationship with the new, the new government leaders and be like, this is what it should look like. And yet we need our systems to adapt and say, this is what we should be doing more of, whatever it might be, affordable housing, great parts, um, and, and so that's what that's about. And our final last strategy is to foster cross-government collaboration to bed health and um, that create all the use decisions. So um, a lot of cities have been thinking about this in particular in Richmond, California, passing and all all policies. Um, basically saying that city government and all departments actually play a role in the impact of health. And so that is something that they uh, acknowledged and um, started to work on. And so um, this is one example. Um, and then I'm sure we go yeah, short of our resources. We have a few minutes left, but we do have um, a few. So the four pillars that I just described and we just went through, we actually have a policy group that we put together. And I have some copies here um, to share with folks. And that might be helpful, Rhonda, for any points. Like you're saying some narrative stuff. I don't know if it'll resonate, but it might be. And then we also have um, a paper on healthy development without displacement as well. I don't have a copy with me, but it's all available on the Mention Institute's website if that's accessible. Um, and in addition to that, we also have a paper on production and equities um, uh, that basically outline a lot of the sort of structural um, health, you know, we're seeing what we talked about earlier, like red light um, and, and segregation. So. And most importantly, the idea that as Dr. M said, we've done this so we can undo it. So that, that's a hopeful note. <laughs> yeah. And this is our conversation. So I think 
margarita, we probably have like a minute and a half left. Yes. <clears throat> I'll pass you around a sign-in sheet if people can sign out. Now, I'll be passing this around. Okay. So, any last minute inter comments, interactions with this? Did you walk away with anything that you came to the session for? What? Hey? I was just excited to hear from everyone. Sorry, I'm kind of working on a couple of these. No things. problem. No, just very excited because I oftentimes what happens, especially for me and work working with the East End, is we don't connect it to issues happening in other parts of the city. Yes. So it's very important to make the forefront and say, we're not the only ones that this fight, and we're not the only ones that are struggling through similar, that, that have similar struggles. So it's very exciting to hear about what kind of what's going on with their board and how they have similar issues. Or the the city. Yeah, um, yes. that's great. And maybe that. there's room for a broader network, because we found that helpful in changing the broader ecosystem because there's a lot of benefit in, in keeping communities isolated and acting as if it's one isolated decision. But so maybe there's room there. Donna, any thoughts? No, I, I just think it's really good. Cool, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Anyone else? Closing remarks? Go ahead. Um, I didn't know what to expect quite, but this has been really um, refreshing and just to know that, um, you know, we're not in this fight alone and that, um, that there are people concerned with the um, inequity as it relates to um, community values and the, uh, the things that are in place that should be in place for all kids. Agreed. And I actually think getting young people engaged in this is hard but really important because they're the ones who are going to have 30 and 40 years to see this come to fruition. We're, we're on our way down, y'all. <laughs> and, and so getting them involved early so that they can be savvy consumers of information about the land use, about community, and, and they, I mean, we've done stuff where we work with the young people to do photo voice and take pictures of what they see in their community and say, here's a vacant lot, it could be this and that, and that, and then use that to testify. Like, there's so many things. So I would love to, next time we meet, to see, yeah. like, a whole Mufasa Pride program area on healthy right, young sure, people. Sure, <laughs> sure. Anything else? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's actually a good idea, like, to get the youth involved because like what people don't realize, like you have the grandparents and parents actually telling them, well, go to school, do better, so you can move to out of this area yeah. instead of fixing it up. Like that is, they're pushing for that. Like That's for them to, you know. Yeah. Like my son, I took him to my grandmother's house. He saw the dishes and he's like, what is that? I'm like, it's a dish. <laughs> like, he, you know, they just don't, they don't know. Yeah. Like, so, and, and that's what they're being, that's what they're being told. Do better so you don't, so you can, you can have better. Not to say that this is better or we can fix this. Yeah. And and then just to Donna's point, like, you know, I just feel like community isn't necessarily only what you see on the ground. And so like come back here because these are, you know, whatever your people or shared narrative or this is what nurtures you and you know, we I mean to me there's so much re stitching of our social fabric that happens when you're tied to a place and you know, so if you just go move and you live in a fancy place that looks great, but you don't know your neighbors or, you know, and you've lost something. In my mind, you've lost something. And, and that's a hard conversation to have. Yeah. Very hard. But, yeah. So, got to go I, I, do, yeah, I mean, one of the things that I kind of been thinking about is just, I mean, it's like, how do we get communities to the point where um, they have a community plan and more of a, a said they'll be thinking in terms of coming to a community, they have to go to the community council, so to speak. And then the council said, no, this does meet with our plan, this does not, you know, as opposed to waiting until it's so further down the line that it's almost impossible for you to reverse it. So they have a solution. I have a solution, but they ain't going to work together. But so the use of health impact assessment and getting the buy-in from the districts or whatever the little jurisdiction of a particular neighborhood um, is and, and having them use, implement the health impact assessment kind of use that as a process to engage with the community and, and know what the, uh, the risk factors are, yes. negative and positive health impacts, whatever plan or whatever's going away. But 
No, it's huge. And what we, we um, and I don't, I would have to know a little bit more about how the, the jurisdiction and the lines of authority work here. But in our context, one of the challenges is they go out and have the community plan, but then we have, in our government, our local government is called a weak mayor and we have no city manager. So with, with the weak mayor system, it means that basically there's no one high up in government saying we're going to adhere to the community plan. So the developers go straight to our city council people and would be like, oh, I want to build a big condo development here. So we call that internally the broken land use system that we work in. So we, we both need, so in order to not make people feel like their input is just tokenized and exercised, we also need a process where we're holding our local electeds accountable to that. Yes. And then we need to continue to have, I think, probably media exposing these yes. practices. Um, so we need a, I mean, really, we need to move a, a bigger social movement around yes. this because it's really, it's really a problem um, yeah. that is based. But so that the gist of it is yes and. We need to pull back the curtain on this behavior. I mean, in LA, there's so many times when the developer has already figured out the project with the council person before it even comes in front of the which is a violation of public, you know, our, our brown, what we would call a brown act, like the public meetings uh, of thing. So that's a huge problem, and it's corruption, really. And for, in our first session, someone used the term politically conjectured, which constituted. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>